Hello friends, I am Dr. Vijay Prakash and today I will be telling you about pre-prosthetic surgery in complete denture prosthodontics or in a broader way we can say mouth preparation of complete denture patients. Now whenever we are working on a complete denture, when, whenever we are fabricating a complete denture, uh, we should ensure uh, that the tissues which we are having, they are in a good condition. At the same time, we should, uh, if possible, we should survey the cast and whenever we find an abnormality or whenever there you identify a potential problem which can um, result in instable dentures or which may compromise the support or retention of the processes, then you should go for uh, some kind of non-surgical or surgical procedures. Now, non-surgical and surgical procedures, they come under mouth preparation in complete denture patients. Now what are objectives of mouth preparation? Objectives of mouth preparations are firstly to improve the denture foundation, one, improve the uh, ridge relationship, improve the support uh, and restore the form and function of the somatognatic system and also improve the aesthetics. Now as I just mentioned that there are two methods in which you can prepare the mouth to receive the complete dentures. They are one the non-surgical methods and secondly you have a surgical method or pre-prosthetic surgery. What are non-surgical methods? There are five types of non-surgical methods. Let's see one by one. One is rest of denture bearing areas. Sometimes you may encounter a clinical situation in which you have you may have some kind of inflamed or red, uh, red tissues, uh, redness uh, on the uh, mucosa. So the simplest way in this situation is uh, you ask the patient to remove the dentures uh, for some uh, days, for a few days and you can also use, if, if the patient is not ready, willing to uh, do that, you can also use temporary soft liners, soft liners for um, some period of time. Time duration for how much days or uh, how much time the patient has to uh, give rest to the tissues or remove the dentures from using it will depend on uh, the current condition of the uh, tissues. Um, a rest of around 48 to 72 hours is usually advised like 2 to 3 days you ask the patient to remove the dentures uh, so that uh, that uh, soreness or redness resolves. If you find any uh, irritation on the impression surface of the denture you can always trim that and relieve uh, that so that uh, it does not again uh, reoccur. Now second uh, non-surgical method is correcting occlusion. Of course we all know that faulty occlusion if um, there is any kind of premature contact or uh, if there is uh, faulty occlusion in your dentures then there are all chances that there will be generalized redness or even if it is severe that may result into bone loss uh, also accompanied by hyperplastic tissue formation and that can all happen. So if you have a heavy uh, contact, occlusal contact, first thing you have to do is relieve that contact and uh, the patient will immediately uh, you know appreciate uh, that uh, there is something which is very heavy which has been uh, relieved from there and the patient will feel comfortable. So premature contact or a heavy contact uh, should always be uh, relieved, should be removed uh, because if you are not removing that it will cause excess of pressure on the uh, residual ridges and which may lead to uh, residual increase residual ridge resorption. Next non-surgical method is extension of the denture. Of course we all know that if uh, we have a correctly extended denture that is going to uh, enhance the retention and stability of the processes and most of the old dentures you find they are underextended but in case whatever denture we have fabricated they are overextended uh, you should always correct the extension um, and uh, make sure uh, once you have corrected the extension there is no ex overextension left because overextension is going to uh, make the dentures instable and also will irritate the tissues and uh, there will be inflammation. So if you have an inflamed tissue there, you remove the denture, trim the overextension. Uh, you can uh, also use a tissue conditioner if you have, if you find the situation uh, the tissues are too much inflamed 
or if you just relieve the denture and if you ask the patient to uh, give rest to the tissues then it may resolve itself so this is one of the methods the non surgical methods next method is good nutrition that is another uh, advise the patient to have good nutrition and uh, follow good nutritional programs because such patients usually uh, are uh, find it difficult for chewing and eating so you should uh, always educate them to have a good balanced diet and a nutritious food and uh, next type of non surgical method is conditioning of the patient's musculature now sometimes the patient uh, will come to you when in uh, you have to advise the patient to do some kind of jaw exercises uh, so as to help uh, in relaxation of the muscles which may be strain or uh, or to strengthen their coordination so you can always advise them uh, against uh, doing some kind of exercise and these jaw uh, exercises are very useful uh, in those patients who find it difficult to follow your instructions and um, uh, if they find difficulty in coordinating mandibular uh, movements so these uh, exercises jaw exercises are very useful Uh, in recording, especially the uh, jaw relations at that time. So these were all the uh, non-surgical methods. Next, we come to pre-prosthetic surgery. Now, the surgical methods. Now, what is pre-prosthetic surgery? By definition, pre-prosthetic surgery are uh, surgical procedures designed to facilitate a fabrication of prosthesis or to improve the prognosis of prosthodontic care. And uh, you it, it is aimed to prepare uh, the jaws the edentulous jaws to accept the best possible complete edge processes and the edentulous jaw is also aimed uh, the surgical procedure is also aimed to um, have the edentulous jaws which can provide an ideal shape and form so as to have a uh, processes which is having good retention resistance and support and also uh, which will improve the longevity of your treatment and the uh, there will be less stress on the residual ridges so it will also improve the overall health of the patient now uh, pre prosthetic surgery can be of two types one is minor pre prosthetic surgical procedures another one is major uh, pre prosthetic surgical procedures first the minor pre prosthetic surgical procedures under this we have alveoloplasty So what is alveoloplasty? Alveoloplasty is basically shaping uh, the contour of the uh, residual ridge or bone uh, that is done after extraction and the most common way of doing it uh, is which will result in a least amount of bone resorption is where as soon as you do extraction uh, uh, you uh, you should digitally compress the sockets Uh, and uh, that will that will make sure that you don't have any kind of sharp bony spicules later on or there is no uh, untoward uh, bony contours which will uh, which will pose a problem when we are making complete dentures but problem may be when the patient walks into you uh, into your office and uh, he has undergone uh, recent multiple extractions have been done and you have very sharp spicules very uh, bony ridges which makes it very difficult and it is very painful for the patient to touch and it, be- it becomes very difficult for you to make an impression and you you feel that uh, okay it will not be possible to have a, a, a good prosthesis over a particular ridge then in such cases what you need to do is you have to do a alveolar alveoloplasty procedure Now, surgical technique for alveoloplasty is firstly you reflect the periosteum. So, the periosteum you are going to reflect. You reflect the periosteum. You will find uh, the the empty sockets uh, where from where uh, the tooth must have been removed, and these um, these areas you can just use a ronger or a round burr in order to. uh smoothen them or remove a sharp spicules or a bony prominence so this can you can use a bone ronger or you can also use a rotary burr uh and surgically remove the sharpness or uh extra bone which is posing a problem which will pose a problem when you are when you will be fabricating complete dentures 
once we have done the procedure then after that you are going to approximate the flaps and then suture it and allow it to heal so this is in short how we do uh, the alveoloplasty or septal alveoloplasty next type of uh, pre prosthetic uh, procedure is phrenectomy now phrenectomy is basically surgical excision of the frenum uh, sometimes in clinical practice you will encounter a situation say uh, for example you have a a very prominent very bulbous uh, labial frenum or a buccal frenum and you uh, you know that this uh, particular very uh, thick uh, frenum is going to interfere in uh, the in your uh, fabrication of the processes also in long term uh, this will lead to uh, you know uh, fracture of your uh, processes that we are complete dentures so in so, uh, such cases you go for surgical excision of the frenum and this procedure is known as phrenectomy or phrenotomy now phrenectomy is indicated when you have a band of fibrous tissues as i told you which attaches near the crest of the residual ridge and you have a very bulbous thick band of tissues which uh, which will basically displace the denture during function so in such cases you have to this kind of procedure most commonly uh, you have a hypertrophic maxillary labial frenum uh, which interfere with denture functions and uh, followed by lingual frenum and maxillary buccal frenum now there are different techniques for phrenectomy uh, you have the most commonly used technique which is you give a diamond excision you do a diamond excision, excision in this place and remove the excess of tissues or you can do a z plasty technique as it is being shown here and uh, a vy advancement technique now uh, as i told you diamond excision is the most commonly used technique to release maxillary and mandibular labial frenum and z plasty technique is used when the frenum is broad and short and also it is attaching to the crest of the uh, ridges so here what you are going to do you are going to give a z shaped incision and uh, once you have given a z shaped incision you are going to reflect the flaps and you are going to remove the excess of tissues and do the phrenectomy procedure and after that you are going to approximate the flap and then uh, suture uh, suture it apart from this you have vy advancement technique which is used when you have uh, apart from having a thick bulbous uh, bulky uh, your uh, labial frenum it, it, there is also decrease in the nasal base with uh, which is desired so in those cases you are going to use vy advancement technique and when you are doing a uh, mandibular phrenectomy it is advisable uh, to give uh, tongue traction sutures uh, so as to improve the visibility uh, and uh, you can control the tongue better and also you have um, uh, you can see and, and then uh, do the procedure uh, without having any interference from the tongue movements here i will advise you uh, to watch one of my videos which which in which i have done phrenectomy and i will share that uh, link uh, in the description of the video so you can go through that now next type of pre prosthetic procedure is excision of redundant soft tissues or papillary hyperplasia or also epullous fissuratum now if a patient is wearing uh, a faulty processes say a faulty complete dentures for a long period of time then um, there is excess of non inflammatory tissues and these tissues uh, they can be in the palatal region the center of the palate they can be in the form of papillary hyperplasia you can have uh, thick tissues redundant tissues so these tissues should be removed because uh, because these tissues are if they are not removed then they will cause instability in our dentures and also there will be increased inflammation in that area these papillary hyperplasia can also be accompanied by candidial infection so it is very important uh, that you uh, remove such a tissues now attempt should be done in order to reduce the size of the lesion preoperatively uh, by uh, providing relief to the denture first thing and you can also use tissue conditioners and antifungal agent make sure uh, that the size of the lesion is reduced and then you can go for uh, soft tissue removal Uh, which can be done by surgical excision curettage electrosurgery 
or by using uh, simply using a large uh, rotatory bar or even a laser ablation similarly you also have epilis fissuratum now epilis fissuratum is also called by uh, caused by using faulty processes you have uh, this kind of uh, extension of the uh, the soft tissues they are excess of soft tissues redundant soft tissues which should be removed so surgically uh, you remove it by giving a surgical excision by using a sharp pp blade and then once you have excised this then you you reduce and uh, once you have reduced this then you uh, suture and close the wound like in papillary hyperplasia in this uh, case also you can use um, electrocautery or cryosurgery or laser excision so all these uh, techniques you can use laser excision uh, usually offers better hemostasis and uh, also has reduced post operative pain so you can prefer according to whatever um, whatever method you are having availing with and you are comfortable with now next type of pre prosthetic surgery is uh, maxillary tuberosity reduction and exostosis removal now in 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 clinical practice you may again uh, see you may uh, come across patients who are having a very bulbous very thick maxillary tuberosity now this uh, thickened maxillary tuberosity it could be because of the the bony prominence or it could be because of the overlying soft tissues so in either case uh, it is very difficult to construct or fabricate uh, complete dentures because uh, it will lead to instable dentures in one thing secondly uh, in in very severe cases you may have a severe undercut which may not even allow you to fabricate the processes so in such situation what we have to do you should go for um, a pre prosthetic surgery and removal of this excess of tissue so if you are able to make an impression then you should have a diagnostic model and you should survey that uh, diagnostic model or um, articulate that cast and that that will help you in planning the amount and location of tissue removal now how to do this uh, first thing what we have to do is the excess of tuberosity where you have excess of tissues you give an elliptic elliptical incision and uh, you will reflect the flap and once we have reflected the flap the excess of soft tissue uh, with this elliptical incision you are going to remove this type of fibrous tissues like this and then uh, approximate this flap and then suture it uh, accordingly now suppose if it is a bony prominence say for example this is uh, instead of this fibrous tissues you have a bony prominence so once we have this big bony prominence here uh, you will be reducing with the help of say a surgical burr or um, uh, some kind of a chisel you can use in order to reduce the bone and then uh, once you have reduced that bone satisfactorily then you approximate the flap and suture it apart from uh, uh, rotary burr you can also use a ronger uh, in order to remove the excess of bone now next type of pre prosthetic uh, procedure is uh, tori removal now tori can be uh, located in the palate region or in the uh, in the lingual in the mandible region now in the palate uh, that is very commonly seen in the center of the palate and suppose you have a small uh, torus so this small torus can be conservatively uh, you don't require to do any kind of pre prosthetic surgery you can always relieve that area and then fabricate your processes or if you have adequate amount of retention you can uh, you can go for uh, some kind of uh, horseshoe kind of processes but suppose uh, the palatal tori is too large then in those cases uh, pre prosthetic surgery is indicated now how do we do that you will be making an incision uh, a y shaped incision uh, on the center of the uh, torus and then you are going to reflect the uh, periosteum you are going to reflect nicely and once you have reflected that then you will be doing small sections like this with a small thin burr you are going to make these small sections and each section then you can uh, remove with the help of chisel and one by one you can get rid of that we have one thing which we have to very uh, very clear clearly understand is you should not make very deep um, sections because if you are making very deep sections 
you may come close to the floor of the pallet and that will become very dangerous so you have to be very careful and carefully you have to remove each section and once you have done that then you are going to suture it back and after suturing you in order to avoid any kind of uh, you know post operative complications you will give a clear acrylic stent uh, for uh, the so that there is less bleeding and uh, the patient is comfortable in uh, making functional uh, functional movements during speech and uh, while uh, chewing and eating so this procedure uh, it is always advisable that you um, you should uh, an oral maxillofacial surgeon should do and uh, we should understand the possible complications in uh, removal of very large tori is nasal perforation you can have oro nasal or anteral fistula formation uh, there can be palatal tissue necrosis and a big hematoma can also be uh, there so you we have to be very careful when we are doing this type of surgery now the lingual torus is mostly in the premolar region and you will have a very thick uh, bony prominence which is there in the premolar region and this will definitely interfere in your construction of your dentures so what we should do we should remove uh, such a torus and uh, so that it does not hinder uh, in uh, making our fabrication of our uh, processes so how do we do that you are going to uh, give an incision here reflect the flap and once you have this bony prominence what you are going to do you are going to do a superior grooving and uh, this grooving is done so as to uh, facilitate uh, the easy removal of the excess of bone and this is done with the help of either a uh, either a rotary bar or a chisel and then once you have done that then you were you are going to approximate the flap and then uh, suture it suture the uh, wound here also possible complications can be hemorrhage of the floor of the mouth and there can be infection so definitely you have to involve a oral maxillofacial surgeon here next type of pre prosthetic surgery is myelohyde ridge reduction now whenever uh, there is vertical bone resorption of the bone in the posterior mandible uh, that may result in a prominent myelohyde ridge as you can see in the figure also it is a very prominent myelohyde ridge and definitely when you are making a processes we are we are wanting to fabricate uh, a complete denture then uh, this will interfere uh, in your uh, fabrication and because of this it is indicated for uh, pre prosthetic surgery this prominence is also going to limit your lingual extension of the processes so your processes will also not have a good retention and stability of the processes so once we have indicated for uh, removal of this myelohyde region uh, incision is made uh, on the posterior aspect of the mandible and uh, which is uh, on the crest of the ridge and uh, the muco mucoperistole flap is reflected and with the rotary bar uh, or a bone file you can use a bone file also uh, in order to reduce the prominence of the ridge primary closure is then achieved by giving sutures and uh, later on you can give a stent or a modified denture uh, which is placed immediately uh, to position the muscle more inferiorly so that uh, the again recurrence is not there so these were all uh, the minor pre prosthetic surgical procedures next we have the major pre prosthetic surgical procedures in this we have ridge augmentation now what is ridge augmentation ridge augmentation by definition is to increase in size beyond the existing size uh, in alveolar ridge augmentation bone grafts or alloplastic materials are used to increase the size of an atrophic alveolar ridge so in clinical practice you may encounter uh, situations in which you have a highly resorbed uh, maxilla or a mandible so in those cases uh, it is indicated for ridge augmentation now what are the factors which affect ridge augmentation success one the type of the augmentation material what you are using like uh, the autografts allografts or alloplasts we all know that autografts are the best uh, augmentation material the site of augmentation where you are actually augmenting and the surgical and prosthodontic design of the processes 
Next is uh, the factor which affects is whether the patient is willing to go for uh, that kind of surgical procedures and whether he will be coming for prosthodontic follow up uh, procedures. So all these uh, factors are very important. Apart from this, the physical and mental condition of the patient and of course the skill of the surgeon and prosthodontist. So all these are very important whenever you want to attempt a ridge augmentation procedures. Before, since it is a major uh, pre-prosthetic surgery, you have to take a proper, uh, you have to do a proper diagnosis and treatment planning. You have to take thorough medical and dental history, uh, complete radiographic evaluation. You may take CBCT uh, in this situation, frontal and profile radiographs, photographs. Uh, you have to take radiographs and photographs uh, are obtained after uh, satisfactory jaw relations. You can do uh, uh, do mounting of your cast. You can do a mock-up surgery and uh, see what will be your final result, uh, what it will look like, uh, especially the relationship of your uh, maxilla and mandible. And uh, what you have to ensure is a minimum of 16 to 18 millimeters of interhouse space uh, should be there in order to fabricate uh, satisfactory complete dentures. Now what are the techniques which are commonly used for ridge augmentation? One is visor osteotomy. Now in this technique the buccolingual dimension of the mandible is split. That is uh, in this you are going to split the buccolingual dimension of the mandible and the lingual cortical bone is repositioned superiorly. Now this becomes very uh, very uh, you know complex until unless you are highly trained in this uh, there are all chances that uh, there will be incidence of paresthesia of the mandibular nerve as the positioning of the mandibular nerve in a very in a highly resolved mandible is high. So when you have this uh, mental foramen is here, the mandibular nerve is very close to the crest of the residual, uh, residual alveolar ridge and when you are splitting this uh, buccolingually there are all chances that you may injure the nerve and uh, this may cause paresthesias and um, uh, post-operative ridge form uh, following uh, the prognosis of this technique uh, following this post-operatively is poor. So we avoid doing such a procedure. Next type of um, ridge augmentation procedure is an only bone grafting. Now here only bone grafting uh, it is indicated when the bony support in the maxilla and mandible is inadequate that is you have a very thin height of this uh, mandible. So what you are going to do you are going to you are going to take uh, autogenous bone from the iliac crest and uh, you can uh, you there are basically two types of uh, this technique which is the only bone grafting that can be superior only bone grafting or an inferior only bone grafting so in a superior only bone grafting you will take a large chunk of uh, autograft from the iliac crest and uh, then uh, once of course we have reflected the periosteum and then you are going to place it there and uh, uh, secure it in place with the help of uh, titanium wires and uh, the drawback here is one there is a high chance of resorption of the only graft and uh, secondly uh, since the depth of the vestibule uh, is is less so you in order to increase the depth of the vestibule you have to perform another surgery you may have augmented this bone but then the vestibule the vestibule depth is very less so you have to perform another surgery to increase the uh, width of the uh, the increase the depth of the vestibule uh, this was superior only bone grafting likewise you have the inferior only bone grafting as i just told you uh, is the procedure is same Apart from this, you have interpositional bone grafts. Now, in this technique, an osteotomy is performed by splitting the superior inferior dimension of the residual jaw and the bone is grafted uh, in the within this osteotomy. So here what we are doing, we are just splitting the bone uh, in this region. We are making a space there and then we are in that space, we are going to fill uh, the graft material and allow it uh, for ridge augmentation. In, if you are doing this procedure in the maxilla, you will be doing first the leaf fort osteotomy and then you will be performing this interpositional graft procedure. Now advantage with this procedure is you can instead of using uh, the uh, autograft, you can, you can use 
uh, your um, allogenic bone grafts which can be used. So this uh, procedure is basically procedure of choice for mandibular bridge augmentation as it combines uh, the osteotomy technique which is both horizontal and vertical and this procedure involves the movement of the pedicel of the bone along with the blood supply. So this is the advantage of using uh, interpositional bone grafts. Now in cases of a very severe atrophic mandible you can use an inferior bone graft. Uh, inferior bone grafts you can use uh, bone grafts such as freeze dried allogenic material uh, which acts as a tray and you're going to fill uh, this with your autogenous or allogenic graft materials here and then secure the uh, graft material with the help of uh, the titanium uh, wires or screws. It is a very complex procedure and the detail of this procedure I will not be talking here. So the next procedure, uh, if the major pre-prosthetic surgery is vestibuloplasty. By definition, vestibuloplasty is a surgical procedure which is designed to restore alveolar ridge height by lowering the muscle attachment to the buccal, labial and lingual aspect of the jaw. So if you see, there is very less space, the depth of the vestibule is very less. So in this case, uh, this, this procedure is so as to uh, deepen the vestibular depth so that we have adequate um, the ridge, the vestibular depth which will aid in uh, denture retention and stability. What are indications for vestibuloplasty? When other conservative procedures fail, uh, you do a vestibuloplasty in a healthy patient who is highly motivated and also a cooperative patient. So definitely you have to have uh, these all, these, this is all the uh, indications. The contraindications are a medically unfit patient, under, under motivated patient, a very old patient who is med medically compromised, uh, when the vertical ridge height is inadequate, a severely prognathic patient and a patient who cannot bear the cost and time of the treatment. So this, these are all the contraindications. Now there are three techniques in which we do vestibuloplasty. Uh, one is mucosal advancement, uh, the technique which was given by Macintosh and Opsiger and it is indicated when maxillary denture is unstable due to shallow uh, vestibular depth or high muscle attachment. And what do we do uh, here? We can use a mouth mirror test uh, in order to assess the uh, amount of mucosa and here a mouth mirror is used to reflect the soft tissues to the, you use a mouth mirror to reflect the soft tissues to the uh, desired vestibular depth as uh, abnormal shortening of the lip which you, uh, which is not noticed uh, when you are reflecting with the mouth mirror, then uh, you have sufficient mucosa. Uh, in order to do this procedure. Now what do you do here? You are going to make an incision in the ridge. You are going to reflect. Uh, there will be superiostal reflection here. And after that, uh, you are going to, uh, after reflecting the flap, what you are going to do? The intervening submucosal tissues are then excised or repositioned more anteriorly. And um, after that, uh, you are going to give a uh, uh, overextended surgical stent over or an uh, over denture, uh, overextended denture uh, to be placed in the new vestibular depth. Of course, once we have excised the tissues, these flaps you are going to approximate and suture it and over that you are going to place this splint. The surgical st uh, splint or stent or an overextended denture is removed uh, once complete healing has taken place and then you can fabricate a new denture uh, to the uh, new verticular vert uh, vestibular depth. Similar to this procedure we have secondary epithelization. Uh, this procedure is used when we have hypermobile and hyperplastic ridges and, um, uh, and they can be reduced while the ridge is extended. So overcorrection is advised beyond the desired sulcus depth here as the chances of relapse uh, is very high. So in order to get an adequate uh, vertical, uh, vestibular depth, you have to do overcorrection and so that relapse does not occur. Another method uh, for vestibuloplasty is epithelial graft vestibuloplasty. Uh, it is a secondary 
epithelization procedure uh, which uses skin or mucous membrane graft to cover the exposed tissues and this is used when there is a high muscle attachment that interferes with the development of adequate bodice so this is one of the most preferred and predictable of all the uh, vestibular procedures so in this case what you are going to do you are going to place a skin graft uh, and uh, avoid uh, a kind of relapse of the tissues so this is one of the most preferred and predictable of all the vestibular procedures next type of vestibular plasty procedure is lip switch procedure lip switch procedure or also called as transitional flap vestibular plasty was first des described by kazanzian 1935 and it is indicated for patient with insufficient vestibular depth uh, where you are approximating in uh, relation to uh, the where we have mandibular atrophy and there is high muscle and soft tissue attachment so in this technique what we do you you can effectively increase the vestibular depth in a patient having a bone height more than 15 mm so this bone height has to be good but if this tissue is high you can always um, do this procedure and increase the vestibular depth but if the bone height is less than 15 uh, mm then instead of this procedure you should do some other ridge augmentation procedure now what how do we do this uh, procedure you have to do a submucosal dissection which is made from the inner uh, lower lip to the mucogingival junction and then the periosteal uh, after making an uh, incision the flap is reflected and you are going to remove uh, the muscle and the connective tissue attachments in this region as you can see here and uh, then the uh, the periosteal the raised periosteal flap is then adapted to the uh, ex exposed bone and you have a new so the raised mucosal flap is then adapted to the exposed bone here to the depth of a new vestibular uh, vestibule and it is fixed with the help of a stent or a uh, with the help of sutures so the possible complication here with this method is pain edema can be there and um, it could be accompanied by transient uh, mental nerve paresthesia so uh, these are all the procedures which we have discussed here the non surgical and surgical procedures uh, including the pre prosthetic surgery uh, in uh, complete dental prosthodontics i will advise you in order to read more you should uh, refer to a standard uh, textbook of oro maxillofacial surgery uh, it could be kruger or uh, patterson you can refer these books for further uh, reference so this is all about our presentation thank you for watching the video